Thank you, Peter. Uh, indeed, as you said, and, and, and Juliet at the very beginning of the conference already said, uh, this conference used to be called uh, the future of life assurance, and uh, that has changed. A lot of other things have changed, and we've heard it this morning um, about client focus, about the retail re distribution review, re regulatory changes, and so on. I come uh, from the asset management industry, or at least now I do. I used to be an investment banker. And a lot of things have changed there as well in how we approach this space and in what we can do for you in the insurance and the pensions uh, segment of the market. I focus on megatrends. I focus on these changes in this presentation. I keep it high level. I keep it a global view, not UK-centric uh, necessarily because um, as far as our markets go, um, Germany and, uh, and the US and indeed China are still bigger for us than the UK. Um, but I hope you can learn from that. I will give you, therefore, a 30,000 foot view, global view, and also uh, uh, no, uh, uh, no excuses, but apologies, it will be a manufacturing view. It won't be uh, focused so much on distribution. Um, one can't talk about pensions and retirement without talking about sustainability. And sustainability and the issue of, of pensions and retirement, really, uh, one has to talk about at three levels. One is sustainability of current pension systems vis-a-vis -vis demographic changes that are, that are upon us. Second is how sustainable is the business model? Are the business models of the industry? And lastly, when we talk about what's the real purpose of saving for retirement, it's a sustainable lifestyle. And translated into a financial language, it's a sustainable real income. Uh, Laurie said uh, this morning, it's about meat and potatoes. It's, it's, it's about real returns. So let's go straight into, into uh, demographics uh, before we go into detail. Let's imagine this is 1900. We're having this conference now in 1900. If I look around the room, I guess most of us would be at somewhat senior, more senior positions than we are because we would have outlived most of our colleagues. 47 years was the life expectancy, 23 was the median age. It was common for parents to outlive one or two of their children. If you had the magical monkey's paw, the one that gives you the power to grant you uh, three wishes, your first one would have been, let's all live longer. And if you look at the age pyramids, no magic there, you see them in high school, this, you know, this, is, this has clearly happened. But this is how they show them to you on, for example, the US uh, Census website. And it's hard to see what's going on other than, yes, there's a bulge around the baby boom and so on. So, uh, well, another thing you see is actually, in 1900, uh, 65 plus is the highest age group. Then in 1950, they sneak it up to 80 plus and you hardly even notice if you don't look closely. In 1990, it's 100 plus. Also, the x-axis, um, are completely different, but that's how they show it to you. So I've done something very simple. Bring it all to the same scale so you see what's really happening. There's a phenomenal and sustained growth of the elderly underlined by phenomenal population growth as well. So if this were not the 1900s, but the 70s, let's say, you would start, and in fact the world did, start to get worried about population growth and sustainability from that perspective. You get out your monkey's paw, you say, okay, my next wish is maybe we should all have fewer children. Well, that happened too. Okay, so the same data again, uh, this is like the Carl Strobel view of the US Census data. It's exactly the same data, just presented differently. Okay, last 20 years, if we're, losing, if we're losing the children in the 70s, we're losing the taxpayers right now. Okay, and the only population that's growing is the, is the elderly. I'm not telling you anything new when I say these trends are eerily predictable. Okay, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to get worse over the next 20 years. This is US data, and the good news is it's a one-off 20 years later, from the 2030s on, 
uh, that effect will have disappeared. The rest of the world isn't quite so lucky. If you look at Europe, 1950s and 1990s, all on the same scale as normalized by me, then you see the number of elderly just goes up and up and up, and the number of children goes down. And you actually see that the next 20 years, you're losing all the taxpayers and the students, and you're only gain, uh, gaining retired people. And 20 years thereafter, it doesn't stop. It just gets worse and worse. Europe is actually shrinking. Let's look beyond Europe. Uh, first, the first thing I did is actually, in order to understand a little bit what's going on, because hardly anyone will tell you what the reasons are, and I won't either, because, um, because frankly, I don't know. Um, if you look at the difference between Eastern and Western Europe, what you do know that's very interesting is that in Eastern Europe, right after the fall of the, of the Iron Curtain, birth rates dropped by one child per woman. That's more than one child per family in 10 years. It's not even clear how you measure that in such a short space of time, but that's what happened. And if you think that's bad, in China, the same rate of drop has been maintained for three and a half decades. And if you think that's part of the one-child policy, you're wrong. Because uh, Korea and other neighboring countries have had exactly the same drop from 4.8 4 children per woman to 1.4 children per woman on average in the space of 35 years. In fact, on the right-hand side, you see fertility rates in just the less developed regions of the, of the world all taken com uh, together, dropped from uh, more than six to less than three. And on the bottom, you see that the number of children in the world is already going down. While the population is still growing, that's because we all live longer, not because we, um, we, we have so many children. And because in 50 years' time, you can't give birth to 50-year-olds, these people would have to be born now. That is a dead uh, uh, certain predictor that the world is going to shrink. Lastly, um, just to give you another spin on it, if you think immigration is going to solve it, uh, there's a piece of research by a not entirely impartial organization that tends to overstate the problem of population growth usually. Okay, uh, the, uh, the, the, the UN uh, population division, um, they've historically overstated it because the, the most of the funding uh, has been and still is derived from, uh, from programs that limit population growth. Uh, Europe has about a million immigrants per year. Uh, just to keep uh, the population constant, you'd need twice as many. To keep the number of uh, workers constant, you'd need four times as many. And to keep the dependency ratio constant, you'd need 30 times as many. That is the entire size of Canada immigrating into Europe every year. You overlay that with the problem of debt to GDP ratios being at almost historic highs that we've seen last in the Second World War. You overlay that with the fact that the hidden liabilities are much more than they historically have ever been. And then you all understand why you're in this room and in this industry. Short, there's four factors. We live longer, we have fewer children, we've stretched debt to GDP ratios and much more stretched implied liability to GDP ratios. And lastly, and uh, bizarrely, we're actually getting used to uh, uh, retiring younger than we used to, even if the official retirement uh, date is going, uh, uh, shifting out, the labor force participation actually of people uh, at, at specified ages has, has been going down. But don't take my word for it. Smith, uh, the greatest of all economists, once wrote that prosperity is associated with growing populations and depression is associated with declining populations. In the context of flat or falling populations, we have a much greater challenge just to keep the current standard of living what it is. The way you calculate uh, GDP is based fundamentally on the percentage increase in the labor force. That's the, that's the, the the largest component of growth. It's one minus the number of people times their productivity. 
if the labor force is not growing, the GDP is not growing. The reason the world has experienced a population explosion over the past century is not because human beings suddenly started breeding like rabbits, because they finally stopped dying like flies. When you have declining number of consumers at different ages, you discourage research and development, productivity growth, which is the engine, fundamentally, the engine of growth in any economy. If only men <laughs> don't have the population growth and you realize how much you depended on it in the past. So, you've got the sustainability of public systems debated, I think. What about the sustainability of the business model of this industry? What does it mean from a product perspective? Well, you've got three trends at the moment. Pensions are under threat because of demographic and GDP ratios, as discussed. Investors are insecure because there's a shift from defined benefit to defined contribution. So now they're being asked to take capital markets risk with assets that they are already afraid of outliving. And institutions aren't taking over because they are in retreat from the balance sheet damage they have taken in the crisis and from regulations that are fundamentally about two things. This morning we've all focused on the regulations that has to do with consumer protection and transparency and fairness. But all the other regulation that is coming is about one thing, deleveraging. Now deleveraging, that's the outside view, that's the positive way of saying it. The inside view of the financial industry is these regulations are going to make your balance sheets less efficient. They're going to make your equity work harder for the same return. What have we done with this? First of all, in Germany, which is our home market, we have taken a foothold where now in the mass market, 70% of mass market retirement products have DWS, that's our retail brand, have DWS manufacturing inside. That means we actually manufacture the, the, the insurance product. Um, we also uh, have uh, luckily uh, leveraged through various distribution channels uh, within Deutsche, I should mention it briefly and then uh, we go back to the main issue. We have DWS as the retail brand. We have DB Advisors as our institutional brand, Deutsche Insurance Asset Management as the brand that manages insurance balance sheets, and Reef as the brand for alternatives, including uh, things like private equity and, uh, and, and infrastructure. Taking all that combined and creating an insurance product uh, rather than just providing asset management services to the insurance industry uh, is making a big difference. Besides, we are bank-owned and we're able to use balance sheet. And that's a unique differentiator as well. Um, plus, at, at the very senior management levels, we have, uh, uh, including the two bosses of mine, uh, people who have very deep uh, experience with uh, structured retail products. But when I talk about structured products, okay, one thing is maybe our expertise has the needs in the market covered, but I need to be very careful to make a difference between the structured products that you may think have caused the crisis, and maybe you, you, maybe you are even right, and the solutions that we provide to this industry. Um, the alphabet soup of products, CMBSs, ABSs, and so on, didn't make anyone's life easier, uh, least, of you, least of all yours, if you are a product manufacturer or a CFO uh, in, in this industry. And, uh, the, the difference between uh, one of these products is it's transactional. It's a financial contract the, the, uh, giving you a defined payoff under defined scenarios to cover risks that uh, we think we know in advance. When you hire an asset manager, uh, it's a little bit different. Even if you get a structured solution from them or a structured product, it is a contract to provide a specified skill set in a specified process to problems that you may not necessarily anticipate in advance. The revenues and the incentives are very different. I used to be a trader. In fact, I used to be an exotics trader. And the, uh, the, the, the problem there is you're only ever as good as your last trade. Your incentive is, uh, uh, is transaction, uh, transactional volume. We used to get calls from insurance companies every week. 
saying, you know, I've got this risk, get rid of it. Uh, uh, you know, are you the cheapest? Good, let's do it. And the next week, uh, the roundabout starts again, and uh, you, you hedge the risks that have emerged since then. What we do now is we look at, together with the client, how we manage these risks on an ongoing and dynamic basis. Um, and the way we are paid is very different, of course, like everyone else in the asset management industry. It's fundamentally by the amount of trust that you bring to us by measured by assets multiplied by the time we have these assets. And if it goes wrong, I think uh, uh, many a decision maker uh, has found out uh, there's a high personal cost if you, uh, if you have traded unsuitable product. Um, if you hire an advisor, you change the advisor. The buck stops ultimately with the committee that, deci that, that decided to hire the advisor. Briefly, there's a potential client, some pension fund manager says, if the crisis has taught us anything, it's that the cost of investing in talent is minuscule to the cost of not doing so. And simply, if you've bought a structured products, maybe you haven't invested in talent, maybe you know, how often have you maybe done this and, and thought, well, okay, you have actually traded against some talent uh, at best. Uh, whereas us as asset managers, we fundamentally aspire to making you understand and feel and, and, and trust that you have invested in talent when you have invested with us. Okay, so let's go back to the pensions um, space. Uh, and, and the shift that we're seeing there, fundamental shift in how asset management will approach this, okay? If you look at the business in Germany, and uh, uh, for compliance reasons, I can't give you numbers, okay? But this is, the, this is the past growth that we've had in the retirement space in Germany since we entered this market from a standing start. It's a market totally dominated by insurance companies. It was, it still is, and probably will continue to be. This is our projection. What you see is the light blue areas is where we manufacture for other originators. It's not a DWS product, it's not a Deutsche product, it has DWS inside. And only dark blue areas are actually DWS products out there in the market. And that is in the market where our brand, our retail brand, carries enormous brand value. With 25% market share in the mutual fund space, for example, which is larger than any mutual fund manager in any market. But um, our growth has come from manufacturing for originators. So the fundamental trend we are seeing is a separation between origination and manufacturing. Laurie, I believe, called it the assembly model. I think that's a massive opportunity for asset managers. It's also a massive opportunity for, for insurers because now we can take these balance sheet risks that come with guarantees or protection and dissect it into which risks sit better at which industry. And we can only do that by sitting together with you through the entire product design process. That's, that's a shift. That no one is currently doing that, and I think uh, we will have a lot of followers uh, ev eventually in this space. Lastly, uh, and I'm conscious of time, um, Let's talk a little bit about what the real challenge is, what the real purpose of retirement savings is, and that is to sustain your, your real income to, in order to sustain your lifestyle. Just a few thoughts there. The CIO of Calpus, certainly someone who should know, said, look, uh, you know, the fundamental standard method that is sold by consultants is empirically false now, okay? It, it, your portfolio ends up looking out like everybody else's. Uh, uh, it's, it's okay to lose money as long as everyone else is, but it has a horizon problem. It doesn't take into account that on a 20-year view or a 30-year view, you may actually have run out of assets by then. And when you look at a consultant's uh, watch list, it's all about risk. Why is that? Let me give you a very, very simple example. Imagine a saver who saves, now I know this is a little bit unrealistic for a mass market product, but just to make the numbers around 10,000 euros a year. Investment returns are 7% per annum. Um, he does that for 31 years. Uh, and uh, sorry, no, he, he does that for 35 years. 
and then, re and then retires and is one of these people who are lucky or unlucky enough to know exactly how long they're going to have to draw down uh, and live on this, which happens to be 31 years. Uh, just to go through some numbers. How much of the money that is retirement income is going to be from money actually saved? How much is going to be from investment returns while saving? And how much do you think is going to be from investment returns while already retired? This is a pretty standard model, so I'm sure a lot of you know the answer. But basically, it's called the 10-30-60 rule for a reason. Only 10% of the money is money you've actually saved. While you were saving, the investment returns have quadrupled that asset pool. Now you can afford, in this case, an, 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 a retirement of 100,000, 110,000, in fact, per year, um, which, on a straight uh, drawdown basis, would make you run of, out of assets by the age of about 71 and a half. But the returns keep your assets almost intact, and then it increasingly accelerates as you draw down money. This is like paying off a mortgage, basically, except it's the opposite. You're getting the income. And, uh, and, and you're drawing down assets, not paying back debt. Um, the flip side of this is, at the point of retirement, where you have the most assets you'll ever have in your life, your capacity to take any capital markets risk is minimal. If at that point you lost 15% of your, just 15% of your assets, you've lost 40% of your retirement years. If you lost 30% of your assets, you've lost 55 or 60% of your retirement years. Right? Somebody has to take that risk. And clearly, the public can't do it anymore uh, for the reasons outlined in the demographic section earlier. Right? And, and uh, we believe that the only, the only way to do it is by basically making the insurance industry and the asset management industry work together in fundamentally new and smart ways. Uh, because uh, your experience with the banking industry in this, sec in this sector is purely transactional uh, with the appropriate consequence or inappropriate consequences. So I have amassed a whole lot of structurers, what they call in the banking industry, they call it structurers, to do this. And we believe that structuring products with you and for you in the pensions and insurance space uh, is the key to unlocking, uh, now OEP is our German word, but basically pe uh, pension and retirement products. Um, one thing is common in, in all jurisdictions. People struggle to understand what their direct contribution plans mean in terms of actual accrued income. So when you look at um, what products look like now and what products should look like, that's a very jurisdiction-dependent question. But one, one, one thing is common uh, for all. Providers tend to communicate in terms of accrued wealth, and that doesn't make you want to go out and rush for a retirement savings product. What makes you want to uh, go out and rush to save is when you translate it into retirement income, accrued retirement income. And don't rely on the advisor doing that. That's a very tough job. The product has to do that. The product has to speak defined benefit language while being a defined contribution product. Second, uh, there is a even if you can manage that, there is the single issuer, single originator, single insurer risk to contend with. Uh, any advisor who's worth their metal uh, will point out that to, will point that out to you. Um, products we've designed for insurers are now double or triple insured in some cases. Uh, to deal with that, and it can be done at a, believe me, it can be done at a, at a very, um, almost, um, in, well, inconsiderable uh, 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 cost. And the other thing, uh, so that you don't get confused, uh, we, we, we do believe, uh, even though we are structurers, we do believe that one of the most important design parameters in this space is to keep it simple, okay? Um, Differentiate yourself, but in a very simple way. So again, just in summary, we, we believe that the risks in this space 
can no longer be borne by the public, are better borne by the private sector. It's harder for the private sector to bear them. It's harder for them to make money because of these regulations that are also there to protect the public, to, to at least to protect the taxpayer collective. And the only way to do it is by distributing these risks smartly between the segments of banking, insurance, and asset management. Not many asset managers at all apart are engaging in this conversation. Uh, we have made it a very, very successful business model in Germany, and we believe we can take that uh, uh, to you as well. And uh, it's supported by our analysis of where the mega trends are going. Thank you very much.